previous session with Sanji, we introduced TikTok and the concept of mobile content. Uh, in this one, which is called The Only Way Is Up, creating sports content for mobile, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that, into the creation of that content. To help me do that are Robbie Spargo, director of Little Dot Sport, uh, Scott Miles, or as you called him this morning, Miles Scott, who's Sky Sports Senior Content Operations Manager, Mike Norrish, Director of Digital and Creative at Premier League Productions, and Sharon Fuller, who's the founder of the Rational Collective. Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us today. This session is going to be in two parts. We're going to do recorded sports content, and then we're going to do live sports content. And we're going to predominantly be looking at things that are 9.16 rather than 16.9. Um, Let's start with what works and why. So each of our guests are going to talk through some projects they've worked on. We're going to start with Mike. Uh, we're going to talk about match day social channel, particularly for uh, the Premier League. So tell us about the work that you do. We have some on the screen to show you while Mike talks. Tell us about what you do and importantly, why you think it works in this format. Sure. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, so the Match Day Social channel is our big mobile first social um, play. Um, just for those who don't know, PLP um, is the sort of production partner for the Premier League. So we're a part of IMG where I joined in, in July. And the, the big reason for me coming and, and the new digital and creative team that I've built was because loads of our broadcasters were telling us that social was super important to their business, so they needed um, more content in order to leverage those big social audiences. Um, so Match Day Social is, is the obvious response to that. Um, thankfully, a lot of what Sanjit from TikTok was talking about, you see in there, which is something of a relief. Um, if we'd have got that completely wrong, that would have been slightly embarrassing today. But um, as you can see here, the <coughs> the Match Day Social channel is a mobile first, um, real time, vertical, story of the day, story of a Premier League match, which is filmed on mobile, is distributed on mobile, uh, and is also kind of curated and organized on there as well. So the whole end-to-end -end, um, production is, is on a phone. Um, and you see a lot of the trends that Sanjit talked about. So behind the scenes um, is, is all here. You know, we're, we're, we're giving you the real intimate, atmospheric story of match day. And it actually starts with players um, from the Premier League games doing selfie videos on the way to the game. We've seen some great um, places you've never been before as a, as a broadcaster, you know, on the team coach, in the hotel when they're having breakfast. As, uh, again, you know, these are not boring sort of sideshow elements of the day. These are, these are really engaging, interesting details and, and facets of, of, um, of the, the Premier League experience that we want to show to fans. So, yeah, it's been, it's been really, really exciting to see that come to life. And is there a particular reason why you think it works for the audience or for the sports fan? I think authenticity is, is the key. Um, you know, we, we do um, UHD 40 camera live um, feeds for every match, and that is and will always be really important. But to take, um, yeah, those kind of raw, intimate, personal um, stories from players and from the atmosphere, it really complements that, that kind of TV coverage in a way which is, I think, is, is really exciting and needed today. If you're just the camera one, you know, you're very detached and you don't feel part of that sort of real conversation. So I think authenticity clearly is, is really important. But to get that distribution right, which means seconds and minutes rather than, you know, the old mm. workflow of, you know, taking things into an edit and taking forever and losing that moment, it has to be in that moment, yep. um, which is what the, the Match the Social channel has been able to achieve. Thank you. And the video will roll on in a second to some other segments. We'll start talking about them now. So you also use archive to create content, yeah. Stacked being another great example. Um, tell us about the stuff that's going to follow this then. So how else do you use Premier League content? So we obviously, you know, the bulk of our media is, is still 16 by 9. So how do we then reshape that, reimagine that for vertical is, is a key part of the team. Um, so stacked video, we have, have a product called Benchcam, or sort of format called Benchcam, which has the reaction and the, the kind of moment. And that's been really, really successful um, because it gives you an extra, um, yeah, it gives you an extra emotional connection that you didn't have when watching the, the 16 by nine. So first person um, close-ups as well are very important with players. Um, you, you know, you see a lot of that with 
sort of creators, that's the, the behavior that they, um, yeah, that, that they create on, on TikTok and on Instagram. So we're trying to follow that with the way that we shoot athletes and players. So there's lots that, of that sort of creator um, world that we're trying to bring into the way that we, we, we make content and, and really being, being led by those that are native on the platform when we think about what we do with clubs and players. Thank you very much. A great example of the bench cam was, of course, when Mo Salah got the winner when Liverpool played Man City, and of course the, the shot was sort of Pep Guardiola, head in hands, knowing Salah's going to score, with Salah scoring right underneath it, which is a great example of how that worked. I think that went viral. Uh, as, as an example. Let's move on. Robbie, you've done some, so we're moving on from football to Extreme E, but we'll also talk about the FA Cup as well. Robbie, tell us about the work you've done with Extreme E, what you were doing and why you think it worked. Yes, sure. So it's probably quite a nice segue there from what you were saying, Mike, in terms of um, using TikTok native creators to produce your vertical video um, for you. We, so uh, for a bit of context as to, to who we are, we work with a lot of different rights holders, federations, clubs, and broadcasters, and help them with digital video production and distribution on social platforms. Um, Extreme is a really good example of where we've done that vertical first, uh, where we've launched and grown a TikTok account for them. And the approach that we took with that was to use a creator to essentially front the whole channel. The reason that we did that was because Extreme E takes place, uh, if you don't know, in lots of far-flung locations, in locations that are affected generally by climate change. Uh, so they might race in the Amazon, for example, or in the Arctic. Um, it's quite difficult to get crowds there, and therefore, it, for the audience, you're fairly remote from the action that's taking place. And we felt that a presenter on a platform like TikTok would be a really brilliant way to um, uh, to narrow that gap between the audience consuming at home and the action taking place in this remote location. So we actually were fortunate enough to, enough to come across uh, Alexa Rendell, who uh, was a young TikTok creator. She was already producing lots of videos around uh, electric vehicle racing, huge motorsports fan, and we felt that she could really authentically speak to the sport, could talk to the teams, the drivers, the relatively small crew that are actually out there, and get brilliant content from them about what's happening around the action itself. The action is going to be taken care of by broadcast, but everything else that happens around it is something we wanted her to bring through and bring out. So we took a kind of um, original content first approach to, um, to the distribution that we did on, on Extreme E, which is very different to the approach that we took on the other example that I think is playing there um, with the Emirates FA Cup. And the reason that we couldn't take the same approach there is that this is a brand with a, a, a lot, a much longer history. They've got a lot more content and a much bigger archive. And we felt that actually the opportunity there in terms of vertical video was to lead with archive content and to make that a kind of key pillar of our strategy. What that would then enable us to do is if we had a team of creatives working on this account who really know the FA Cup inside out, which they do, uh, they're able to use the content from the archive in uh, tandem with trends that are taking place on the vertical video platforms like TikTok. So if there's a trend, I don't know, there was a big one around running up that hill with Kate Bush, they can use that music, they can match it with some archive, uh, create some kind of um, trend that is going to, create some kind of content that's going to tap into the virality of that trend and, and gain more exposure for the cup that way. And then around that archive, we felt that we could sort of um, elevate the work that we do with, uh, with match clips, obviously uh, within the rights that the FA um, retain, uh, and then certain number of originals, but really those being done uh, in collaboration with, um, with other creators around the platform. So that was a much more archive-led strategy, see by the, um, the Thierry Henry example that would have played there. Um, taking archive and just elevating it slightly, matching it up with music and viral trends uh, to, to make it cut through a little bit more strongly than it would otherwise. Thank you very much. Scott, I guess you've got some similar examples, but we're going to talk, uh, we've got some f more football to show. We've got uh, Yuri Tielemans uh, scoring some goals and putting some funny faces. But tell me what you do at Sky when it comes to sort of 916 content. Yeah, uh, hi everybody. Uh, so I think for us, we've got a huge breadth of, of 16 by 9 content shot. We don't shoot anything really in 916, but we're getting more conscious of, of we want to produce in 916. And obviously, our, our live output and all of our broadcast, we're trying to identify those moments. 
and it's moments like the, the Tielemans goals, two very similar goals that he scored, um, that the 916 frame just gives you a different take. It gives us the ability to use real estate in a different way that in a traditional 16 by 9 view you wouldn't be able to do. So we wouldn't be able to present these two goals at once. Um, and obviously the freeze frame on James Madison's face is gold as well. And I think that just attracts an audience when they see that, and, you know, at that moment they want to see it. And I think that the key to, to Sanjeet's point as well is it's got to be relevant, it's got to be quick, it's got to be in the moment. So we need to draw that audience in immediately, especially on a platform like TikTok. Um, the interview was brilliant as well. And, and again, the faces from, from Tielemans reacting to Madison's uh, man of the match performance. Um, and then we're talking about shooting content. We are shooting in 16.9, but we're trying to be more conscious around the 9.16. The, the Pickford uh, chat around the Jorginho penalty from the, the Euro finals and the, the pep talk he gave himself. We're making sure that when we're sending our crews out and we're shooting this content, that we're, we're framing sensibly. So when it comes back into to producing, we're able to, to produce 16.9 versions, absolutely. We want that on our platforms. Uh, but equally, we would need to be relevant, present on other platforms, and we need that 9.16 version. So the guys are, are really smartly doing that, and then we're bringing it into in-house, and we're producing the content, and we're, we're able to get it broadly across everything because we've got such a variety of platforms and such a wide breadth of audience to reach we need to offer a, a huge variety of content now it's the only way thank you um Sharon, you waited very patiently we're going to contrast quite starkly what scott's been talking about there multi-million pound premier league football rights with some more up-and-coming sports should we call them um Freestyle Football Association, Freestyle uh, Gymnastics, uh, Fabio Vib, uh, is it Vibmer? Yes. Vibmer, who's an Aust Austrian cyclist and stuntman, <laughs> who we're going to see doing some crazy shit in a minute on the screen. So tell me, <laughs> tell me, uh, and you're thinking TikTok first, where Scott's talking about broadcast first, you're social first, aren't you? So tell us how these pieces work for you, and why, why they come about, and why they're successful. So this is, uh, the video is just to give an example of how a 16-9 uh, a a video is then, is then reframed. And a lot of the stuff that we're shooting, we're shooting actually on 360 degree cameras so that we can actually fully reshape and re-edit in a spherical edit rather than looking at taking something which is a flat image and just putting a box around it. So it's much more detail in terms of the way that we're thinking about how we edit these things. Um, and a lot of that innovation comes from the fact that these people don't have a lot of budget when they're starting out. So um, with some of our sports, like freestyle football, they naturally fit to a kind of 916 frame. And actually, a lot of those athletes already have quite significant followings on TikTok. And then you're bringing it into a professional sport kind of the other way around. Um, with something like freestyle trampolining, it's naturally a 916 sport. So these are sports which have been born in social, which are already having an engaged audience and then are kind of moving in the opposite direction to everyone else. Rather than going broadcast down, we're kind of going social up um, what is it that you think I, oh, I know why I like it because it's crazy but what, what is it that, about this particular type of content that works so well on mobile then well, what's, what we're doing here is also actually taking the graphics off a of video. We're right. simplifying it. Um, this works with or without sound. It has an incredible soundtrack, but this actually is designed to work without sound as well, so that it's more mobile friendly. Um, part of this is actually built around a campaign so that it's intended to capture your eye instantly because we're not, uh, we're not sports that have a casual audience that's just following football in the way that you would. This has got to capture your attention super fast in that kind of swiping environment. So everything we're doing, we're thinking about every shot and the composition of it at the top of a video to make sure it's capturing attention and stops you to make you watch it. Fantastic, thank you. Let's talk a bit more generally now, if we can. Um, Scott, I think you mentioned briefly the need to be everywhere. How realistic is it to be everywhere? Can you create different versions of content for every single different platform, every single mobile platform? Is that a realistic proposition? It's, it's not. It's probably not realistic. It's a challenge. It's a challenge, and we try and remain relevant. I think it's identifying the right content for the right platforms. Right. So, so a moment like, you know, the, the Tielemans face, his reaction to that interview, brilliant. It's a viral thing. Um, there's, we want to create those short moments that are going to be immediately drawing people to watch and keeping them in. We then have the different activations, sponsorship activations. How do we create content around that? But equally, try and explore the vertical 
way of doing it, um, and that's where we have to shoot sensitively. Um, there are tools. Obviously, there's, there's AI. There's various things we can look at around helping us produce that content. But I think we're still, we're still on a journey. We don't know. We're not going to continually uh, employ more and more people to create for more and more platforms. Because I think the platform numbers are going to grow. So we're going to have to get smarter. Mm. We're going to have to be selective, strategize. And we're going to have to work with partners and internally probably to develop technology to, to aid us and help us do that. Mike, go yeah, on. just to pick up on what Scott said around how you direct a shoot um, and how you have um, both aspect ratios in your mind when you are going, I think that's really, really important for now, where we are now, where we go in the future, who knows, but where we are today, I think um, publishers get it wrong when they just think about 16 by 9, beautiful big wide shots, you know, four camera cuts, and then literally the last thing they do is give it to the most junior AP to turn that into a vertical video, you know, which is actually the, the version that people are going to watch. So right from the start, you need to be thinking, yes, this isn't a completely independent side-by-side -side productions. It's still one shoot, still one production. But the way that that's directed, you know, more singles, tighter, close-ups, you need all those shots to come back to base to then make both versions, and they need to be made properly with care and attention. So we're, we're making a big promo for the return of the Premier League um, after the World Cup. And that will be primarily, you know, um, for broadcasters on, on linear, but there'll be a huge social play on that. And I don't want that to be compromised or diminished because, you know, we've spent five minutes making the, the square or the vertical version. It needs to be thought of throughout the whole process. Yeah. I mean, Shama, you would agree with that. That's the, the yeah. way around you're looking at it. it exactly. Yeah. But what we do is yeah. we, we, go, we look at the idea in the start and how it's going to be executed in all of the different places. So it's not that it's this and then we're making it into that. It's like, what's the central idea? And then what's the execution of that? Because the different versions need different things, but you can capture everything all at once. So with this, with this video, We've, we've thought about the central idea, which is actually Grand Theft Bike. It's a tribute to Grand Theft Auto on bikes, um, which you can't really tell in this, in this clip from it. But actually, if you think about that as a central idea, the actual ways that you can execute that that's native to the right platforms, capturing all the material, but it's not a version of the same edit. They're completely different edits, but from the same material captured. So it's all about the central idea first and how it's executed in what I've called 360 degrees. And actually, by actually shooting with 360 cameras, it massively helps us to be able to reframe that to start with, rather than thinking about everything's kind of flat. Uh, Robbie, slightly on the same theme but slightly different. Is there a way? Is there a suggestion here that because it's mobile, you could actually put the cameras somewhere different? So rather than trying to capture everything and make it smaller, could you actually, rather than sticking that wide shot in the middle of the, the main stand, could you put a camera somewhere different to make specific mobile content? Is that a way to make it work? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And having camera operators who are actually using mobiles Mobile. to capture yeah, yeah. content, and yeah. I think the examples yeah. you showed there are great. You're going to get closer up imagery. It's going to be more intimate, you're going to feel it more, it's going to be more emotive. Um, a, a camera behind the goal does, a mobile phone behind the goal in football does a huge amount more than a wide shot, yep. just providing you with a, a, some, of the, some of the field of play action. So absolutely, I think having those digital producers with phones on the ground gives you those different shots. And just to add to that, even the audio has is, is been really interesting. You know, clearly um, the new iPhones, you know, the, the video has moved forward quicker than the audio have has, but actually, when you listen to that that goal behind, you know, through and captured in the audio way, it does feel more real than than a beautiful Dolby sound. So it's kind of, you know, it's really interesting to, to when we think about the phones as as production tools rather than just viewing, um, yeah, viewing devices. Then then actually they're, they're innovate, innovating us in really interesting ways. Thank I think, you. Um, just. I mean, Sanjit made the point that a lot of people come to TikTok not for necessarily the highlights or the live broadcast or the footage from the match. They come to it for the shoulder content. And actually, this is the shoulder content. It's giving you a different perspective. And that's kind of why you want to be there consuming content on TikTok rather than turning on your TV broadcast. Yep. Understood. Now, time's running away from us, but I want to talk about live. Um, and there's a lot of pressure here on Scott. Um, we're going to show a bit of boxing footage uh, on the screen from a boxer fight night that Sky did quite recently, um, which is 9.16. Scott, tell us about how this was produced, 
And I think more importantly, uh, the challenges, because I know it wasn't, uh, wasn't massively straightforward. Um, and I'm going to ask you another question. So give us that first. How did that production manifest itself to start with? Uh, so, so we picked this up. We, we took on the, so first of all, we took on the Bundesliga uh, Super Cup at the start of last season. And we broadcast that in vertical on our app. Yep. Um, and we kind of looked at that, looked how it was done. And it was done in a fairly heavy way, I thought. And then I saw the La Liga version, which was twice the crew. Um, and we kind of thought there's, there's something here to be played with, but it's not sustainable to do it in such a broad way. And it still isn't. Uh, you can't run two side-by-side -side complete productions. So for the boxing, we saw it as an opportunity. We think boxing lends itself quite nicely. Um, generally, you've got two people upright most of the time until one of them's not. Um, and we used the production we had going on anyway. So we were showing this live in 16.9 on our platforms. And we, again, sensitively thought about camera positions, what they were doing, and we were taking center cuts from our main cameras. Uh, and we brought four additional ISOs back to our, our base where we were doing remote production into gallery. So we had a clean, uh, we had um, an additional one with, with graphics, and then we had two cameras that we, we put in specifically in the corners. So we were trying to capture something different. So rather than just serve the live experience flipped on its side uh, in app, we were filming the coaches. Uh, so the, the corner men there and trying to capture that moment, that again, that rawness, that kind of feeling like you're, you're in the content, you're, you're there, you're close to it. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, and we, we ultimately, we didn't shoot, again, we didn't shoot anything vertically. Um, we just used the real estate and we used it differently. Um, we had a great kind of graphics palette there of, you know, uh, that made it look really fancy uh, and looked great. I think we offered a different experience to what you would have got on TV. We've done two of them now and we kind of, we learned a lot from them. Um, they only took, I think we counted five additional people so on top of you know, doing a full production, this was five people to deliver this vertical version. Um, and we learned a lot from it. I think we don't know if there's a space yet for it to be a, a long-term thing. I think if, if live, vo live sport in vertical is a thing, we can't do it in the ways we've been doing it so far. Well, that was going to be my it's question. It's not sustainable, yeah, right? We're, yeah. we're learning, and we need to get smarter if we're going to do that, because you cannot do two versions. Yeah. You, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, but equally, is it where people want to watch it? We need to learn that, and I don't think we know the answer. Yeah, there is a Jurassic Park question here. Well, just because you can doesn't mean you say you necessarily should, but I think it's probably a question for an entirely different session. Um, Sharon, you've done some live stuff. Yes. You, your way of doing things was quite different from Scott, though, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, it was. So um, my previous client, the eScooter Championship, we did do live streaming in 916, and we did it twice. Um, and actually the way that we did it was to use a, a resizing piece of software which was driven remotely. So we sent the 16.9 the feedback, used a piece of software and reframed it and we broadcast it onto our website, um, which was designed that you would watch it in 9.16. And actually what we did, it was in partnership with NEP, um, but we made the graphics swipeable. So we took all of the graphics off the feed so you could swipe sideways and see the results and the timing and then swipe them off again to give people an option to see how usable it was in terms of the 916. And actually, people were swiping on and off to see what the status was, but they were mostly using it without the graphics on, which for us was a super interesting thing. Um, the other thing that we did is we provided... So we took no extra people on site to do that. And we, uh, because it was all then managed remotely, uh, we also were able to send them a reverse feed to the camera guys so they could see how the framing was working in 916 and reframe what they were doing um, without having any additional people. It was two extra people back in the remote gallery. Editorially speaking, did you, was it a success? Did you, did you think you successfully produced a nice piece of content? I think it was a, a good piece of content. I think it showed a different uh, view to the sport because actually it was much closer in on a lot of the action. Yep. And the other thing about electric scooters where they were the right shape, yeah. the right yeah. <laughs> it was conveniently fitting yeah. for 916. I'm yeah. not sure it would work for every sport, but that kind of framing for that kind of sport really worked. That's a beautiful segue to my next question. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, uh, Robbie and or Mike, do certain sports lend themselves better to 916 than other sports? Robbie, do you want to take that? 
Yes. Are you talking specifically about live or...? Yes. So, but in fact, b both live and preview but there's certain... Do you need to... There's table tennis, because it's a nice square shape. It's trampolining, which we'll come to in a second. These are... Do they lend us better to it than...? Yeah, I think, I think absolutely. And I think the point's been made that some of these sports, just the way that they're set up, lend themselves much better to vertical. And I think when it comes to live, you need to really think about whether it's worth the extra ask of a yeah. viewer to consume it uh, in a format that might not be quite so aesthetically pleasing rather than just turning their phone around. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if you're going to consume a football match for 90 minutes, probably if you're going to sit down and watch for 90 minutes, you can go to the extent of turning your phone around to watch it. Yeah. Um, so I think you've, you've got to really think carefully about whether it's genuinely uh, the right kind of um, uh, cost benefit for the viewer. Yeah. I think when it comes to video on demand, almost anything can work in vertical, yeah. but with the kind of editorial approach that we've seen with the split screens, uh, with a different angle, um, with a different editorial take on it, basically. Thank you. Um, Mike, what's your take on this generally? Is football a good sport for live 916? Not really. No, there you no. Go. <laughs> I don't think it is. Physically, you know, it's about dimensions of the pitch, isn't yeah. it? Um, but I think the other factor, I agree with what, um, what Robbie and Scott were saying, I think the other factor is around audience. So, you know, golf, for example, could be a good sport, but are there loads of golf fans on TikTok who are desperately looking for a vertical version of the, you know, <laughs> sort of Portugal <laughs> Masters? No, probably not, you know, which is why fighting is such a good example. Yeah. Because, you know, it is, so there's two considerations. There's the sort of size of the pitch and the camera angles, and then there's, is, is that audience on those vertical platforms? Are they, you know, and all of the sports that Sharon um, has talked about there, you know, absolutely, and, and also I think, fo you know, fighting. Football's probably the one, right, which has a massive TikTok audience, but then has the, the problem of the pitch dimensions, and I don't think you're going to enhance the viewing experience by turning it around, certainly not for live. No. So flipping that on its head, um, something like trampolining probably wouldn't necessarily work on television, but actually is ideal for social media. So you're working with the Freestyling Trampolining Freestyle Associ Association. Yeah. I'm glad we got that out. Tell us, uh, elaborate on that. That would work far better, surely, on a mobile than on my big screen telly at home. Yeah, so the, the sort of trampolining that we're talking about here, I, I call it Red Bull Cliff Diving in Reverse. It's right. really, really high. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and actually the reason why they bounce so high is so they can get so many tricks in before they get bounced back and back up again. So for a sport like that, it's, it, you know, it's born on TikTok and Instagram. Um, it's actually where it comes from. And the community of flippers, which if you look it up, if you don't know, is actually really massive. Um, Flippers make money out of a career of showing what they can do in vertical video on social. But then when you try to put, take it out of vertical and put it into, into traditional telly, it just doesn't work. It just looks like a big wide room with someone jumping up and down. You're le much less focused on the action. So it's one of the few things, I think, where it, it lives for 916. Fantastic. We're coming to the end. I want to bring this all together. Um, you each got to go at this sort of quick fire final round. Um, thinking about everything we've talked about so far, um, both live and pre-recorded, how will the thirst for mobile content and thinking mobile first impact the broader sports broadcasting sector? So in, the, in this room, there will be people from all sorts of parts of sports broadcasting, be, be it the camera, a, a traditional OB end right through to app developers. When we're thinking mobile first, when do you first share, and if that's okay, what, what will this new way of thinking, how will it impact on the wider market? I think there's some sports that will just never go to TV and they won't care about it because they'll be able to monetize themselves entirely in this way. Um, and I think that that kind of has a lot of impact in terms of the traditional model of how you might become an Olympic sport, for example, mm -hmm. because some sports, a lot of sports historically really care about that and I think that this will become less of a thing. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Mike, how about yourself? What's the wider connotations of all this? I think one of the things we haven't talked about is that the, you know, when it comes to live, is the experience of what, what you're actually doing while you're watching. Mm. And you know, if I'm watching a, a, a football match on TV or, or cricket on TV, I'm actually using my phone yep. very heavily throughout that. So if we just you know, think of live as, you know, as, a, as a passive um, thing, then the mobile is going to be terrible for that because you want to be texting, you want to be um, chatting, betting, being on, on other social platforms in that sort of second screen way. So if we are doing more live on mobile, then it needs to be connected so that you can still read your messages and you don't have to go in and out of apps all the time. Otherwise, you're just forcing people out of there and the, the, 
ultimately dwell time of that sort of live experience will be reduced because of that be native behavior. That's really interesting, really interesting, thank you. Robbie, how about yourself? What do you think this impact will, what's the wider impact of this? So I think for me, what, what we've seen is that uh, the closer that sports content is in terms of the way it's surfaced with other types of content, the more sports content is being influenced by those other types of content. Yeah. And I think uh, we're seeing more and more sport as entertainment, sport crossover mm -hmm. with fashion and music, uh, general entertainment, comedy, uh, and, and that's going to enrich the kind of the sports storytelling landscape and produce some very different types of content because of that proximity um, with, with other genres uh, that's happening on mobile and social platforms. Fabulous, thank you. Scott, final word from you. How do you see this impacting maybe even on, on what Sky does? I mean, or, but more specifically, the broad industry. What, what does thinking mobile first or thinking about the mobile viewing of content, how will it change the way we do things? Uh, I, I think to add, it's kind of a bit what Mike said there. I think there's everyone's watching TV, everyone's watching live sport on their big screens, and they love it, but they're on their phone. And I think for us, we need to learn how do we leverage that? How do we join that together, that experience? And I think, is it by putting something different, additional, unique on the mobile phone uh, that's live as well? Is it about creating an interactive experience that joins the two together? And we've toyed with that a little bit recently with some success. I think we're going to keep producing. We're going to keep delivering for the platforms. And there will be more platforms, and we'll have to adapt to them as well. But we have to be smart about it, and we have to keep working with the technology partners and, and internally with our teams to make sure we're doing it with the resources we've got. And we're... we're attracting the new fans, the new audiences that you know aren't our traditional hardcore viewer, our subscribers that we have today, because we will need those people and we'll need them to come and be customers. That's a great note to leave on. Thank you very much. Really thought-provoking stuff, guys. Thank you for your time. Please join me in thanking the panel for their time today.